Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wednesdays at the Center. This is a series that's hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and Duke Center for International and Global Studies. Today, we are very pleased to welcome University of Hong Kong Professor John Wong, who will talk on a, a talk entitled Hong Kong Takes Flight, Commercial Aviation, and the Making of a Global Hub. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the Oscar L. Tang Family Distinguished Professor of East Asian Studies here at Duke University, Professor Prezenji Dwar. Uh, thank you, Kevin, uh, for um, kicking us off. Yeah, uh, I uh, would like to now talk a little bit about uh, not spend too much time and cut into his uh, speaking time, but introduce uh, Professor John Wong, who's an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is, however, at the Research Triangle Humanities, National Humanities Center this year, where he is uh, doing his research getting good precious time to uh, uh, finish his work, I'm sure. And uh, just some background, he received his BA in economics from the University of Chicago. He uh, got, then got an MBA from Stanford University. And then I believe worked for a while in the financial sector as a, finan as a chartered financial analyst and uh, but then decided to go back to uh, to do a PhD at Harvard University. So you see, he's been there at all the top elite institutions. And I should say that we have uh, a few things in common, although uh, we are separated by many years in age. Uh, one is uh, that he has a distinguished uh, um, uh, sh a background in Chicago, where I spent many years, although we did not quite meet there, and that he and I shared the same advisor at Harvard. So uh, uh, Professor Philip Kuhn, um, and uh, so we must have a lot in common with all those influences. Uh, he is also the author of a work on the 19th century called Global Trade in the 19th Century, the House of Ho Chua and the Canton System, um, which was published in 2016 by Cambridge University Press. <clears throat> and it demonstrates how the China trade partners sustain their economic exchange on a global scale long before Western imperialism ushered in the era of globalization in a Eurocentric modern world, right? So he's really talking about pre-Western uh, forms of globalization, global exchange. He has various other projects, but today he will speak on the development of the airline industry in Hong Kong after World War II. This study explores not only global connections that new flight routes facilitated, but also the imagination and manifestation of modernity through air travel. Uh, his his uh, talk, as you've heard, is entitled Hong Kong Takes Flight, and um, hopefully, and I'm sure, so will our imagination. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. On to you, John. Thank you, Professor Duara, and thank you to uh, all the colleagues at Duke University Center for International and Global Studies for hosting this talk, uh, in particular, Kevin and Meredith, who, were, who are so kind to take care of the logistics of the talk. Um, it's great for us to connect online. I, I know quite a few of you are in the uh, North Carolina area. It's a special place to be talking about aviation. Uh, we don't need to look farther than our license plate to see a person play. Of course, that refers to the 1903 Wrights Brothers uh, takeoff at uh, Kitty Hawk. We know that's quite a distance between technological breakthroughs, especially when we are talking about more of a trial run till you know, the, the, the business becomes an industry. So I'm going to be talking about the development of commercial aviation, the industry of commercial avi aviation from Hong Kong. Let me start to share my screen here. You can all see that. Yes. Let me start by um, showing you a short video just to get us situated. 
not sure how many of you are old enough to uh, recognize scenes from uh, that particular place. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to, I didn't take the video myself, but I did go to school blocks away from there for 12 years of my life. So this, this is my upbringing as well. And the site, of course, is the old airport in Hong Kong, um, Kai Tak Airport. The expanding flight network that this Hong Kong airport surfaced was but the physical manifestation of Hong Kong's expanding regional and global connections. Now, Hong Kong was not simply drawn into the vortex of globalization. You see here a couple of news, newspaper articles from the 1930s talking about Hong Kong as a seaport at the southern tip of China, making it somewhat of a natural candidate for an aviation hub. However, geographical location was only one factor, and there are other factors that animated the development of commercial aviation. As a new technology, aviation held transformative potential um, in remapping global and regional networks. Of course, historical developments fostered a conducive environment for the city's growth into a hub of commercial aviation. But then Hong Kong could also have easily have devolved into a peripheral location on a global map reconfigured by new technologies and geopolitics. Well, we know that's not what happened. Instead, the city fashioned itself into an aviation hub, first by mapping itself onto an evolving aviation network, and then asserting its place within that network through erratic but intensifying traffic flows that extended Hong Kong's reach to regional destinations first, and then to distant connections later on. So in that sense, the story of the old airport of Hong Kong, Kai Tak, is Hong Kong's story as well. Hong Kong's growth as a nexus of commercial aviation, as well as a nexus of the regional and global economy, was no less breathtaking and at times treacherous as the takeoffs and landings at the old Kai Tak. So in my project, rather than understanding air travel as the inevitable outcome of Hong Kong's arrival in the age of global mobility, I argue that Hong Kong's development into a region on global hub was not preordained. This new mode of transportation, while well, relatively new in the 1930s, grew out of an existing network of connections. And just like in any system, there's inertia in that system. And by that, I, meant the, I mean the entrenched interests, in particular companies that were working on logistics, especially via maritime routes. Keenly aware of the disruptive potential of this new technology, these entrenched interests uh, worked to shape commercial aviation to their advantage and mitigated the risk of any seismic impact on the competitive landscape. Well, you have inertia, but then this is also new. And for this new technology, investments needed to be made. And by that, I mean not just planes, but also infrastructure. And to make such investments, we need to figure out what type of elements this network is supposed to carry. Uh, it could be people, it could be goods, it could be information. And so we need to explore the flows in this network to understand what drove its growth. So by underscoring the shifting process that produced the hub of Hong Kong, I aim to describe globalization and global networks in the making. Just to uh, extend in the, uh, the metaphor a little bit more, this is the flight plan for the next 30, 40 minutes. First, we'll look at um, the 1930s, how Hong Kong mapped itself onto this new form of infrastructure. And then by the 40s and the 50s, you have some sudden and well, some long in the making uh, geopolitical shifts that necessitated Hong Kong's reorienting itself, especially in aviation. By the 60s and the 70s, Hong Kong had settled into somewhat of a regional pattern. And in that regional pattern, how did Hong Kong, in particular its airline Cathay Pacific, brand itself? By the 70s, Hong Kong was starting to break out of this regional network and that extended into the 80s. What Hong Kong needed to do in that moment and how did it do it to break into the farther away destinations would be the following topic. And we'll end, although the, uh, the, uh, the developments didn't end there because from the 1980s onward, Hong Kong needed to recast itself uh, primarily because of more geopolitical shifts uh, not just the reopening of China, 
but also his own political uncertainty, in particular in 1997. So as I focus on these key historical junctures, we explore how various interested parties wired Hong Kong into the international network, how geopolitical upheavals transformed the city into an aviation hub, and how participants in Hong Kong wove the city into a transnational infrastructure and in the process advanced their interests. So who exactly were these actors? Well, early on, you see here a couple of them, uh, Pan America plotting is routes uh, that emanated from the US to the other side of the Pacific. And in China, there is China National Aviation Corporation, CNAC. As a matter of fact, Pan Am was an investor in CNAC. And together, they were trying to construct a network that funneled traffic from mainland China through the southern end of the landmass to the rest of the world. Who did they care to connect with? Well, you have the imperial routes emanating from Europe. In Southeast Asia, colonial regimes were striving to connect the metropoles to the colonies. Although by the 1930s, the British Empire uh, may have lost some of its luster, the British airline, Imperial Airways, stake out its claim with aerial connections to Hong Kong, the empire's foothold in the region. You see how here on the map, Imperial Airways is charting flight routes against existing geopolitical formations. I'll also draw your attention to this peculiar feature in the early days, which points to a technological limitation. Notice the short distances that flights would cover. So why is it important? It's important because you're lucky to be on the map. But as technology matured, that's the distinct possibility of being bypassed. So let me get you to the scenes of arrival. The big day was March 24, 1936, the long awaited landing of the Imperial Airlines Dorado in Hong Kong. The service inaugurated the flight's uh, pattern, pattern from, Hong Kong, from London to Hong Kong. On board this inaugural flight were 16 bags of mail weighing 47 kilograms and a single passenger. So it's important for us to remember that airlines facilitated connections, not merely of the physical transport of people over long distances, but equally importantly, if not more so, of information flow in the form of mail and later on other forms of uh, communication. This is a picture of the plane itself. That Imperial Airways had established its services in Hong Kong made the British colony a more desirable location for Pan Am and CNAC. A newspaper in Hong Kong noted, few people in Hong Kong realize that the total mileage of the airlines in China exceeds that of Imperial Airways. Some called um, it in the best interest of Hong Kong to secure air services, not just to the British network in China, but also to North America, and that these connections would definitely place Hong Kong on the aerial map of the world, they claim. So when they talked about the mapping of the world, what, what they were interested in was this issue of circumnavigation. A Hong Kong uh, newspaper article said, Hong Kong to London, well, that's British Imperial Airways, five days. London to New York, two days. New York to San Francisco, so domestic service in the US, four days. Uh, San Francisco to Hong Kong, four days. That's yet to be realized. So in their mind, Hong Kong was to become as critical a link as London, New York, and San Francisco. A local Hong Kong newspaper, a local Chinese newspaper in Hong Kong concurred. Hong Kong would become a nexus of civil aviation worldwide. And the enthusiasm was noticeable as they projected further expansion of routes, not only to Britain, the United States, and China, but also to the Netherlands, France, the Soviet Union, and Japan. So of the Imperial Airways, who came, ne who came next? Well, the grand entrance uh, did not go to Pan America. It was first CNAC. This is November 5th, 1936. Notice here a CNAC flying boat inaugurated regular service that linked together Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Canton. 
Pan Am was not far behind. It followed in April of 1937. Their plane, the China Clipper, began its first flight from San Francisco on April 21st, 1937, destination Hong Kong, where it was, quote, to connect with the Imperial Airways route, which has its far east terminus at that colony. So in Manila, they changed planes and another Pan Am Clipper uh, finished the Hong Kong bound portion. And after circling over Hong Kong, the Pan Am Clipper landed in Kowloon Bay. And I use landed here a little bit more liberally. The head of the colonial services in Hong Kong, basically the governor, was at hand to welcome the flight. And he said, today we celebrate the final welding of perhaps the most important link in the chain of world communication. Hong Kong is only a tiny place, but our magnificent harbor has been on the map for quite a long time. And now it is our hope that Hong Kong will be equally on the air map with London in one direction and New York in the other. And Am's representative was of, was, cause, was, was of course there as well. And he said, it is significant that today at this magnificent airport in the most beautiful of all harbors, you have witnessed the first direct connection between the services of Pan American and your great Imperial Airways. Notice the different landing mechanism. This is quite a different picture from the landing um, of the flight and, and even the structure of the aircraft that uh, Imperial Airways flew to Hong Kong for its inaugural flight. At that time, technology had not matured into a common platform, evidenced by the different landing gears. So what made Hong Kong into an early hub? Well, Hong Kong's status as a British colony, its attraction to American interest as a focal point in the region, as well as its role as China's outlet to the Western world. Notice here on the far left that Hong Kong was on a branch not quite a trunk route, trunk route meaning uh, the, the route designated by the, the political entity as the main, the main route uh, for military and commercial purposes. Hong Kong was on the sideline. And as you can see from the maps, it was on the sideline because of its potential to expand, in particular expand north from Hong Kong to China and beyond. Well, that would have to wait because we know what came after that was World War II. So Hong Kong needed to regroup, resize, and reorient its aviation routes. But all the post-war planning that happened um, didn't happen actually after the war. It happened in 1944 already. And in the world of commercial aviation, Britain's interests conflicted with those of its wartime ally, the United States, which was seeking to expand its global influence by constructing an infrastructure of airways. The logic of the air, as it was called, foreshadowed a new world order. The emergence of the United States as the new global leader was to be predicated not on territorial holdings, but on the access that airways would facilitate. Well, as for the British, they went back to Hong Kong, and in a report of, uh, penned in 1946, British officials called Hong Kong a most important link in the network of post-war aviation. Why is it so important? Within easy reach from Hong Kong were Saigon, Singapore, the Republic of China's capital of Nanjing, Manila, and other locations in Japan. Whereas for Britain itself, Imperial Airways had by that time been reincarnated as British Overseas Airways Corporation, BOAC. And in Hong Kong, they needed a new airport. So in March of 1947, a technical team representing the Ministry of Civil Aviation, Air Ministry, and BOAC arrived to examine aerodromes, as airports were called at that time, not just in Hong Kong, but throughout the Far East. In the meantime, BOAC launched weekly flying boat service, that's August of 46, connecting Hong Kong to the UK with a six day route. In 1949, Kai-Tak was busy. Um, in that year, the number of passengers doubled to 2,000, or sorry, to 20,043. 75% of them traveling to or from China. Augmenting the services of long haul carriers, in particular BOAC, were two Hong Kong airlines. As you see in the bottom, the one that we are more familiar with, Cathay Pacific, 
which was started uh, by uh, two Mavericks, one American and one Australian. But by the late 40s, they had been superseded by a uh, British Commonwealth conglomerate led by Swire. And in the top, you have this long forgotten airline called Hong Kong Airways. In fact, it was a joint venture between BOAC and Jardine Matheson. That you have Jardine and Swire on this chart, that's no coincidence. Those two have been working in this region in the business of moving things around, logistics business um, for a whole century. So that they were striving to, um, to, to enshrine themselves in the existing network uh, was no surprise. And by May of 1949, they have reached an agreement. Cathay Pacific was to be responsible for the area south of Hong Kong and Hong Kong Airways, north of Hong Kong. So this is a traffic pattern that came from that. Cathay Pacific uh, occupied what came to be known as Southeast Asia, Hong Kong Airways, north of Hong Kong, in particular China. Unfortunately for them, um, they faced some operational issues from the get-go. First, it was uh, competition from mainland Chinese um, airlines, uh, fair wars and all. But you know, more importantly, it was communist advances that killed services first to Shanghai, and by November of 1949, Canton as well. So the North-South split was an untimely deal for Hong Kong Airways. And for Hong Kong as a whole, by 1950, 1951, it was a horrible time. Air, air, aircraft movements plummeted 76%, and total passenger count down 74%. Hong Kong Airways started to move to other places, of course, with the KMT to Taipei as well, and later even got the green lights to go to Japan. But their fault was that they chartered planes from the US carrier, Northwest Airlines. That Hong Kong Airways flew as an operator sanctioned by the British authorities using equipment with the US flag was an embarrassment to the UK. Try they did for a whole decade, no less. But by 1959, Hong Kong Airways ceased operations. It came to be merged with Cathay Pacific. So BOEC unwound its investments and operations in Hong Kong Airways, ostensibly to cut down its commitments in various parts of the world and to confine its interests to the Hong trunk route services. And in Hong Kong, they, they, they pledged to confine their role to consultation for Cathay Pacific on tariff issues. Sure, BOAC was to leave control and management whenever possible in local hands, but the British authorities were quite intent on protecting the trunk route monopoly of BOAC. As a regional operator, Cathay Pacific could run sector services, uh, sector services or services that BOAC cannot take on uh, through its through services, uh, or if there's a need for short stage services. In general, it's only in addition to and not competing with the trunk services of BOAC. So getting back to the whole idea of infrastructure, well, the British had grand ambitions before this. They had uh, thought that they were going to plan a new airport elsewhere, uh, but with resizing the plummeting traffic flow and um, northern expansion curtailed, they had to regroup and decided that they would go back to Kai Tak. So what we, what we saw from that point on uh, were many, was many incremental improvements to Kai Tak. And in this period, late 50s, was to uh, prepare the arrival of jet planes. So this was the reoriented pattern of commercial aviation through Hong Kong. You have long-standing shipping interests endeavoring to shape the budding industry of commercial aviation. The Cathay Pacific was still to be subjugated to BOAC, a carrier that controlled the trunk routes of the old imperial network. Cathay Pacific emerged as Hong Kong's airline to operate in a decolonizing zone that came to be reformulated as Southeast Asia. Slowly but surely, traffic grew. Cold War dynamics rejuvenated commercial air flows through Hong Kong by the mid 1950s and continued to propel the flow of traffic. In terms of breakdown, uh, it's not a huge surprise that the US initially represented the majority of incoming visitors to Hong Kong, 28% in 1969. But that was soon eclipsed by Japan, 
uh, which reached a high as um, a high of 37% in 1973. Southeast Asia took a larger share um, in 1980, but only due to Japan again by the mid 1980s. Taiwan would rise to prominence by the late 1980s and represented one fifth of the total during the last decade of colonial Hong Kong. So that's the general picture of the traffic flow, but just to go back to Cathay Pacific in the 60s and the 70s. This was the, uh, the pattern of traffic that they had to contend with. And within this pattern, they had to figure out how to differentiate themselves from regional and international rivals. Cathay's branding um, is not so unique in that respect because to compete in a global marketplace dominated by Western ideologies, practices, and expectations, Asian carriers construct ambiguous notions of Asian-ness, often by conscripting female bodies, and in the case of airlines, it's the flight attendants. In the 1940s and 50s, Cathay hostesses wore conservatively designed uniforms, militarily inspired gear, but by 1962, this is the uh, picture that you see here, um, they, they had come up with a new uniform design. It's obvious that you have this Chinese uh, heritage featured quite prominently in this ensemble, the Mandarin collar, Chinese style buttons. But as you can, you might have also picked up in the picture, it doesn't quite sit well with um, you know, everything that Cathay was trying to do because the airline was trying to project a cosmopolitan image uh, with its crew. And in particular, with the flight attendants, which they uh, whom they recruited from this whole catchment area, the service area in Southeast Asia. The next round actually muted this issue. Um, in 1969, they introduced a round of uniform that uh, emphasized functionality. They said hostesses, like astronauts, need the right type of clothing for flexibility and mobility. But that air hostesses began to greet passengers in this un new uniform in 1969 was no coincidence. That was a year of the first manned moon landing in space race. Dial for another five years, 1974. We have another round of uh, fashion redesign or uniform redesign. And this time it emphasized fashion. As a matter of fact, more of the business suit type of fashion. And all these deliberate efforts to create distinctive visuals for the Cathay Pacific brand came with the designer price. The mastermind behind this uh, Dong Hoi Eastern Sea Ensemble was none other than Pierre Beaumont, the French designer responsible for, among other things, the iconic Singapore girl dressed in the Salon Kabaya for Singapore Airlines. It was first of many brand name fashion designers to create a distinctive look for Cathay Pacific cabin crew. In 1983, um, this uniform was to be superseded by MS, and in 1990, Nina Ricci. So for the rest of Hong Kong's colonial days, French haute couture dictated the rendition of Cathay Pacific's cosmopolitan in its cabin crew uniform. The fashion icons that Cathay Pacific presented in each era signified the positioning of the airline as well as the city it represented in the region and in the world of commercial aviation. This is an ad that Cathay Pacific placed in the US in 1971. You see its representation of mixed elements of cosmopolitanism. Cathay Pacific claimed the space of Hong Kong, but projected an image of a larger catchment area in the nebulous region, the Orient. The airline was trying to make the best of all worlds, of course, with local sensitivities of Hong Kong in the region. And we can, well, if you can see the tiny prints uh, on this poster, we can pick out some of the lines there. The airline claimed the backing of the political regime, of course, hence the British airline. It offered European know-how, expertise, and technical reliability, hence our British million mile jet pilots and skilled maintenance crews. It embraced other Western elements renowned for their cultural distinction. So you have Swiss chefs and the tempting international cuisine. Beyond the warm embrace of these Western comfort and world-class luxury, Cathay Pacific ordered its cust or, uh, offered its customer oriental charm, formulated to suit its customer's needs. Front and foremost, of course, the prettiest faces of nine exotic lands smiling at you. 
Well, mind you, this is not the only uh, sexist uh, type of advertisement in the airline industry. It was, it was everywhere. But these prettiest faces of Cathay Pacific spoke 23 languages, um, of course, to accentuate the airline's assertion of its local awareness. With su such capabilities will be of no use to the Western travelers, except for the fact that they also spoke English, of course. The name of the airline, Cathay, invoked magic as much as the region it served, the Orient. To entice travelers to fly Cathay Pacific, the airline enticed them to explore not just the airline's home base of Hong Kong, but its broader home turf of the Orient. As travelers embarked on the journey to, as the, as the air shows, to discover the many faces of the Orient, they began their encounter with this mystical region, with the comfort of Western amenities and in the company of the locals who came equipped with an understanding of their needs. So Cathay had this um, regional pattern up through the early 70s. It was just on the cups of um, breaking out of this regional pattern. And what did they need? What did Hong Kong need for that to happen? Well, infrastructure again. So of course, it all unfolded against the backdrop of uh, the regulation of, of that period. But just as importantly, if not more so, were the technological breakthrough that we witnessed in the 70s. Planes could cover longer distances. So there's not as much of a need to negotiate landing rights at transit points. Of course, as I mentioned before, that also came with the risk of being bypassed. So back to the airport. You know, in spite of the last round of uh, construction, Hightech needed a longer runway, and this time to welcome the jumbo jets, in, in particular the Boeing 747. Fortunate for Hong Kong at that moment, it was already an overperforming colony in a waning imperial network. So we managed to fund that locally. So the results, 1974, Cathay started its direct flight, direct of uh, any airline to Sydney. 1983, service from Hong Kong to Vancouver, the first of any airlines uh, in the British realm, uh, British or Hong Kong British, uh, to North America from Hong Kong. And it's all the more important because it unfolded just as Cathay negotiated his rights to fly to London, 1980. All very impressive, isn't it? But then it came with the additional complication of that period. China. China reopened, and it was important, not just for the market, the alluring market that it offered, but also the airspace over the PRC. Britain was eager to gain Beijing's permission for British Airways to fly over China for its connections to Hong Kong. A convenience, as they call it, that was estimated to result in savings of two million pounds per year on the pattern of service in 1978. So back to Cathay Pacific, how did they position themselves for it then? Well, I, I mentioned to you that the airline was started by uh, this duo, American and Australian, that yielded to a British Commonwealth configuration. But by 19, 1978, um, this is the pattern of shareholding in Cathay Pacific. 60% wire, 15% British Airways, and 25% HSBC, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. Why is that important? Well, that was a period of growth. You need to buy planes. What better than to have uh, on your shareholder list the de facto central bank in Hong Kong? So a couple of years later, British Airways would go away, primarily over the diverging interests that it saw um, vis-a-vis Cathay Pacific over connections to London. But more importantly, in addition to uh, the reform era in China, you have uncertainties over the future of Hong Kong past 1997. So Cathay was in a rush a rush to make themselves more local. Here you see the initial public offerings of Cathay Pacific in May of 1986. And they didn't do it just in terms of shareholding. There was also the yielding of some seats of control here in the cockpit. Cathay Pacific was starting to hire pilots locally, at least pilot trainees. Well, this is not charity, they had competition. Mainland-backed Dragon Air come onto the scene and they have started to do exactly that. So a lot of efforts, shareholding, hiring, 
to change the profile of the company, but not quite enough. And here we'll see a whole series of events that unfolded in the decade leading up to the handover. 1987, Beijing buys $2 billion stake in Cathay Pacific. Um, that was CITIC, the uh, mainland investment arm, acquiring 12.5% of Cathay Pacific. The transaction reduced Swire's ownership to 50.23%, and HSBC, 16.43%. Why am I so specific? Well, because the airline was. They were quick to point out that together, Swire and HSBC still hold 66.66% of the airline, a carefully calibrated two thirds. In 1990, you have this uh, unusual partnership between two rivals. Dragon Air was getting into operational and um, financial difficulties. So Cathay Pacific became one of the investors and partners and used Dragon Air to uh, initially penetrate uh, the PRC market. It kept going. 1992. Cathay lost its long-standing shareholder, HSBC. So of course, gone was the two-third majority that they are so carefully crafted. So I did hold on to his majority stake in Cathay for a few more years, though. Um, even under his watch, the airline needed to mute its British shareholding ahead of the handover. So in 1993, what, what happened was that you have the painting over of the Yuan Jack on delivery. As seen the executive said, we are taking a good hard look at ourselves and seeing we are no longer British airline. We are Hong Kong airline. There's really no point in having a British flag. So they said, but an article in the Asian Wall Street Journal uh, remarked, shedding the airline's colonial image, quote, requires a lot more than a few buckets of paint. And sure enough, it did. April 1996, Citic bought more shares in Cathay Pacific, increasing his ownership to 25%. As a result, Swire's short soil shareholding diluted to 43.9%, below a simple majority. So in preparation of the handover, Cathay Pacific changed its shareholding. Citic up to 25%, Swire 43.9%. The rest of the shareholding, the 31.1%, some of it was held by mainland interests like CNAC, not the old CNAC, but CNAC reconnated under the CCP. So Swire's simple majority shareholding in Cathay Pacific was finally eclipsed a year before the 1997 handover. The Asian Wall Street Journal called it post-1997 political insurance. London newspaper, the independent. Happy landings for Hong Kong. The Swires have shown that it pays to kowtow to China's capitalists. The handover of 1997 might have seemed smooth, but it was only possible through a calibrated shareholding realignment and deliberate boardroom maneuvers. Well, I've taken you on uh, quite a whirlwind tour. The history of commercial aviation in Hong Kong is a story of how a new technological a transportation technology facilitated Hong Kong's growth into a metropolis and we mapped the city onto the modern world. We explored how commercial aviation fashioned the regional and global connections against the backdrop of shifting geopolitics and response to the exigencies of Hong Kong's economic development. We investigated how Hong Kong's political and economic development reflected the structure and institutions of its commercial aviation industry and how in turn the industry influenced and facilitated the city's development into a hub against the backdrop of a reconfiguring global network. Hong Kong's evolution into an aviation hub parallels the making of Hong Kong, which was rife with challenges that were overcome only through a combination of geographical, geopolitical happenstance and enterprising efforts. The turbulence of air traffic into Hong Kong's Kai Tak Airport as well as its triumphant takeoffs, epitomizes the historical continuities and disruptions that punctuated Hong Kong's growth into a metropolis. The findings here remain instructive today as shifting geopolitics reconfigure Hong Kong's centrality as a hub and Hong Kongers reimagine the place in a world of rerouting traffic. Thank you very much and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, uh, John.
uh, that was very informative. And uh, we have, uh, I'm sure we have, uh, we'll have many questions, though they're yet to come in, I think. Um, but I can uh, kick off um, and wait uh, for the others. Um, the, the one thing I, I mean, what you said, especially in the, the economic history or the financial history of Cathay Pacific uh, was uh, very interesting, I thought, as uh, a gradual transition from imperialist ownership to, to Hong Kong ownership to uh, Chinese-dominated uh, ownership. And uh, I wonder if this, uh, if the gradual transition applies to other investments and other assets and other forms within Hong Kong, so that it's been a much more gradual process and somehow this, this window that was uh, signed off uh, in 1984 uh, allowed that kind of strategic thinking uh, on the part of the Chinese and how uh, the, and also the complex politics of how these other uh, investors uh, agreed to it, agreed to sell. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's the agree, there's the amount of levels. Let me, let me just start by saying that uh, for different industries, it uh, marched to different drum beats. It all depends on how mobile the industry uh, happens to be and how much they were making in Hong Kong and how much they could port that over, how robust that, that infrastructure is to other locations. Um, so the more extreme cases I can cite, uh, especially since we're talking about Cathay Pacific, um, basically the flag carrier is the central bank, the Hong Kong bank. Um, it was, well, actually, as, as you well know, went through its own uh, geopolitical turmoils already. The Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation basically became the Hong Kong Bank uh, because Shanghai no more. Uh, and then in the 1980s, they were not quite moving themselves out of Hong Kong. In that period, they built the, the new Norman Foster design headquarters. But then at the same time, they changed the registration to a different location. Let's get out of Hong Kong at least in registration. So now they, they are trying to have one foot um, you know, on each side to, to make things happen. But the transition uh, was uh, noticeable, even though we, we didn't quite focus on it. I lived through that period. Um, a new project that I'm working on looks at uh, the housing market, the real estate market. So you, you had Swai and Jardine being the big landholders um, of much of the price possessions in Hong Kong. But who do we know as uh, the, the real estate uh, developer in Hong Kong? It's not quite Swaya, it's not quite Jardine. It was, it is Li Ka Sheng. And his rise, uh, especially to take over British Hong, was no coincidence by the late uh, 70s, early 80s. So in places where the, the business is more rooted physically in a, in a certain uh, location, um, the transition is more uh, imminent and more important. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Li Ka Shing is a private entrepreneur, so it would be seen as a Hong Kong uh, takeover and not so much a. Or do you agree with that? Or what kind agree. of links does he have with the. Uh, and what is going to happen to his enterprise now? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm not sure if I can answer the last question. I can only speculate. But then you, you're right on. And you can see that in uh, the gradual transformation of what qualified as a Chinese investor, um, look no further than Cathay. So you start as a, a foreign enterprise that became British and only British Commonwealth uh, because it was Swai along with some Australian holdings. And then they tried to transform themselves into Hong Kong, but British Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. What the British was overblown, you cannot do that. So you need to be British, but you need to be local Hong Kong or Hong Kong Chinese. Hence, the incorporation of uh, public shareholders in Cathay Pacific, along with Li Ka-shing and a couple of other um, uh, uh, movers and shakers in Hong Kong. So in that period, it was okay. But by the late 80s, early 90s, that was not sufficient because you have Chinese capital that was eager to make its mark elsewhere. You know, hence, you have the establishment of CITIC and their, and their investment in a company like Cathay Pacific. So in that sense, it is gradual. And uh, if we are caught by surprise, it's only because of our lack of realization of acceptance of that. I, um, 
I certainly feel the plight of um, of companies that are under political pressure. But then at the same time, I I find it quite uh, miraculous that for 25 years the CCP has stomached the uh, you know one of the one of its black areas on the PRC on the under the jurisdiction of the PRC. Uh, operating primarily as uh, well or with with a large shareholder dominated in England. There is a question from Kevin. Uh, I can just read it. It's a straightforward question. Was there an aeronautical law about airplanes flying so low over the city? Yes, we often experience that. Yes. <laughs> Well, it, 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 Kevin, it doesn't look like there was any law, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and uh, I, I have uh, I have uh, uh, you know a, a personal uh, recollection of that because the school I went to seemed to have been the highest point on the flight flight route. I didn't notice that it was actually so dangerous to be going to school there, but um, along a certain flight pattern, and that's not, not uniform across the whole city especially if you are descending from the Northwest, gliding into Kai Tak, they make a sharp turn as well. On that path, the buildings are really low. And it's only after 1997, all of a sudden you have some buildings, aside skyscrapers shooting up into, um, in, in, into the clouds. And it's actually still a, a, a quite a sight. It's not quite as spectacular as the old planes or the planes flying to the airport, but is awkward because you have all these three-story buildings and all of a sudden next to it is a 40-story high-rise uh, next to them. And that's because of this clearance issue. Um, and that's also um, a limiting factor, of, you know, again, for my next project of real estate development. Some of the urban areas in Kowloon came to be redeveloped, but they were too close to, to Kai Tak. So they were limited to, you know, under 15 stories, which in uh, by American standards would be quite high, but not quite in Hong Kong because uh, land is precious. Uh, Enseng has a question, uh, which he will ask. Hi, Enseng. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. We can't okay, see great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the host, uh, yeah, I couldn't unmute myself. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, John, for the very interesting um, talk. Like Prasenjit, I was very uh, interested to see this um, cross holdings running ahead of uh, the integration with, with China from early from the 80s onwards, very interesting. So it looks to me like the um, pure, actually the pure business uh, considerations were actually very um, 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 alert and prepared for the, for the political integration. Uh, so I'd like to ask you along this trend, emphasizing the business uh, dimensions, um, Number one, to update your story beyond the 1990s, um, I presume that when China began its big export drive, 90s onwards, um, Hong Kong had first mover advantage in terms of air and sea logistics. Now, the question I have is um, um, purely on the uh, business logistics uh, considerations, uh, how much how much further has Hong Kong uh, of a runway in terms of first mover advantage on the uh, passenger and cargo logistics? Uh, will um, Guangzhou or Shanghai um, run ahead of it? And can you pass your answer out uh, in terms of passenger versus cargo traffic and with cargo whether intermodal shipping plus air uh, uh, combination is of value and can we think of Hong Kong uh, should we think of Hong Kong as a terminus between uh, east and west or can we think of Hong Kong as in between the US and South Asia or the Middle East? I ask these questions because I work on Dubai and Singapore and these are very comparable questions for me. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, great questions. And uh, well, th that seems to be uh, my preoccupation um, in uh, drafting the conclusion of the book, which seems to be a moving target of sort, <laughs> um, especially with COVID, not just politics. Uh, yes, Hong Kong had a first mover advantage, and it was uh, apparent in the 80s. Uh, 
Uh, and in the 90s, it actually fueled Hong Kong's traffic growth, especially in cargo as well. So cargo is not a big thing for Cathay um, until the 70s, um, or even for the entire industry. Uh, first, because well, there was only so much of the high-end product that needed um, air transportation. But then that quickly changed, and Hong Kong grew quite a bit, so much so that you have uh, 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 freight routes uh, uh, to different destinations, especially to, to America. Um, and that first mover advantage was well leveraged, um, uh, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, as Cathay and the industry in Hong Kong helped the development of aviation in China. So much of what I told you is not just charity on the part of the CCP to leave Cathay alone. It's also that we need to uh, do the long-term planning and full utilization uh, you know, principle, apply that principle uh, to, to Hong Kong's um, uh, even transition period up to 1997. Now, what has happened since then? You know, in that sense, um, Hong Kong was instrumental to, to, to the uh, development in China, especially in this infrastructure. Um, and in terms of cargo and passenger, they, they have taken over um, the, the percentage of traffic uh, in, bo in both of these categories. Now, how should, I, how should we think about Hong Kong as a connection point? Hong Kong is a connection point of many things, uh, but let me just paint you one picture to, to drive home the point. So we usually think of um, the transition of Hong Kong, uh, July 1st, 1997, you know, how Chris Patton rode, rode down the uh, Union Jack, folded it on a rainy day and uh, walked out of Hong Kong, cruised into the sunset with uh, Prince Charles. Well, that's the image that you see a lot in the media. But then a year after that, uh, guess what happened? Well, Kai Tak finally reti was retired and they moved the airport to uh, Chek Lap Kok. Who was at hand to do that? It was none other than um, uh, the leader himself or in Beijing, uh, Jiang, uh, coming over to inaugurate the new airport. And within hours of his departure, inauguration of the blessing of the new airport, uh, who came? But uh, Clinton on route on Air Force One back to America. It was a carefully orchestrated um, tandem visit for the two leaders to say that, well, both China and America are very much invested in the continued uh, pivotal role of Hong Kong as, as not quite a terminus, but a transport point, a connection point, uh, especially between China and the US. Now, in terms of the Middle East, uh, Cathay has, uh, has um, cross holdings uh, in that regard as well. And I think that is going to be an increasingly connected web of uh, airlines and also traffic. Um, and I, I would hope that that stays uh, the same. The trouble right now is that I can almost more easily see the political development. I do not see how we're getting out of COVID. Um, us, the, all of us traveling in the US, uh, we notice that the airports are getting back to uh, at least close to capacity, but in Hong Kong, it's still a ghost city. COVID has not just paralyzed the city, it's basically killed aviation in Hong Kong. Cathay is, is running the low single digit of its pre-COVID capacity. And for a while, cargo was carrying the weight of the airline. But since one uh, pilot or crew member of Cathay contracted COVID and apparently brought it back to Hong Kong, that got killed as well. So it has become quite a great um, uh, confluence of factors uh, for step-up investments of the Hong Kong government and, and the Chinese government as well in Cathay Pacific and perhaps to stage uh, you know, further consolidation in the hands of the Chinese uh, investors in this very crucial airline. And I hope that is going to happen because the, uh, it's been a process long in the making. Uh, more recently, we have the announcement of a new airline in Hong Kong, somewhat reminiscent of uh, Dragon Air. Um, you, know, you have a uh, magnet from, uh, from uh, uh, Shenzhen um, starting an airline called Greater Bay Area Airways. Uh, with many destinations, many licenses, uh, at least under application, uh, but one plane. So how is that going to work? Um, who is going to take over from whom? I don't know. Um, I think for a while, my, 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 my hopes would be for some consolidation uh, with mainland Chinese traffic in which Cathay could play a bigger role, perhaps with a uh, partnership with Hainan, but then Hainan is getting into trouble of his own. So um, it is it is an evolving pattern, uh, largely driven by politics, but now precipitated by more imminent concerns and, well, justifications, rationale, excuses caused by COVID. So 
I hope uh, well, we'll have more to talk about and hopefully something positive in that regard. Thanks, Aang Sang. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. If uh, we have three minutes, so um, don't be shy. I think we have a question from Howard in the chat. Uh, is that? I yeah. can't see it. Howard, why don't you? Uh, oh, yeah. Let me read it. Can you say a bit more about the local perceptions of both Cathay Pacific and the airline industry? How have those views changed over time and how central the industry was to the shaping of Hong Kong identity? Well, I, I guess my, uh, thanks Howard for the question. I guess my argument um, here is that it is part of Hong Kong identity, um, at least up to a certain point in time. It was the pride of Hong Kong, uh, you know, to, to come out of nowhere, becoming or incorporating uh, many of local characteristics, superseding uh, the British persona that started the airline. Um, you know, especially when it was uh, you know, flying farther and farther afield. The, the problem though, and I think that's, um, that's an issue with the construction of Hong Kong identity, is that it's um, usually constructed vis-a-vis -vis mainland China. And in the case of Cathay Pacific, um, I, I hope my explanation here makes sense that you know, the airline has no, or SWI has not a whole lot of choices, but to welcome my, uh, Chinese investment. And the more uh, Cathay Pacific yields to uh, mainland powers, the less Hong Kong people identify with them. So there, there, is, uh, there, there are not so uh, charitable um, phrasing um, by which Hong Kong people call Cathay now. And I don't think there's a whole lot of sympathy uh, for Cathay at the moment, in spite of all the horrible traffic figures I just uh, recited um, for your reference. So I, I think that's still uh, um, very much um, a process in the making. Uh, there was a moment in uh, the recent past, especially during um, the protest, when a Cathay pilot uh, on his, uh, uh, land in his landing announcement um, said nothing uh, you know, a whole lot more than to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you'll, be you, you, you'll be welcomed by a whole bunch of protesters at the airport. Uh, don't be alarmed. This is what's going on. And by the way, uh, you know, uh, Hong Kongers, uh, so, you know, just, just you know, uh, aching, aching Hong Kong is on, but then for that, he got fired. So, you know, the, it just, the, the airline industry, airline employees, uh, customers of the airline, residents of the city, I think we're forging identities for ourselves. And of course, Cathay has become quite a foil uh, for that particular identity that is um, transforming. And uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I hope I will still have a Hong Kong airline to fly back to uh, my hometown in a couple of months uh, and hopefully just as good service and I would think as highly of it. Um, and I hope my fellow Hong Kongers would feel the same. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much. There's some uh, interesting comment that you can look at uh, from Enseng saying Cathay Pacific is a very forward looking name. <laughs> Of course, Cathay could be Kitai, <laughs> which was an interesting choice anyway, right? So um, I will um, pass it over to Kevin or Meredith, uh, but not before thanking you uh, enormously. This was a very interesting talk and clearly uh, uh, people were very interested in the subject. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, thank you, Professor Wong, and for that interesting uh, lecture and story. Uh, thank you also, uh, Professor Dwar, for the moderation, and thank all the attendees for joining us today. Wednesday's nights at the center will continue next Wednesday, March 23rd, with a talk entitled What Comes Next in Columbia's Peace Process with Duke political science participants Gabrielle Levy and Matteo Villamar. Mizar Chaparro. It will be moderated by Dr. and Professor Miguel Rojas Santelo. So thank you again, and we hope to see you next Wednesday, March 23rd at Wednesdays at the Center. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.